If you uh, want to turn, we'll get started this morning. Hebrews chapter 1. So the last couple of weeks in the bulk of this class have been um, kind of highlighting different aspects of God, things that are derived from Scripture, and obviously we're, we're learning everything that we've talked about from the Bible. Uh, this morning we're going to look at that a little different. We're, we're going to look specifically to a passage and, and walk through it um, in relation to, to how we know God. And this morning, timely as it, as it is, we're going to look at how, how we really know God is through Christ. He's revealed himself to us through his son. When we look to Christ, we see, we see God. Um, so hopefully, our, my goal this morning is um, to see that as we're just reading our Bible, we are, are learning and seeing more about God. Um, and then hopefully this, uh, I think it's always good for us to, to have a deeper, more meaningful reminder of, of why Christmas is important, because there is so many distractions that come into it. Um, thankfully, I think this morning as a church, we'll really, really highlight that as we sing the truths of Christmas, as we um, hear the Christmas story taught, we'll be in Luke 2 uh, for the sermon, and then uh, the walk to the manger as we, as we give, and as our pastor, senior pastor, has encouraged us to give more to missions this year than to any other person, give more back to, to Jesus in the advancement of his word. So I think today will be a good reminder, and hopefully that starts today uh, in this class right here as we, as we look to Christ and uh, what he tells us of God. Um, we're going to read the, the whole first chapter of Hebrews 1, and we're going to really hone in on the, just the first four verses this morning and, and walk through those together. Um, so look with me in Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is much more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond our companions. And you, Lord... Laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So Hebrews, we don't know the author of, um, lots of different theories, but it is, if you go on, it is recapping uh, the history of Israel, and it's pointing, again, to Christ, and we see that here at the, at the very beginning of, of chapter 1. Um, the writer writes, long ago. So God's plan has been unfolding for a long time at the point that this was written, the early first century. Um, obviously, we know just from the Old Testament that the expanse of time that's passed is, is a, quite numerous. A lot of years have gone by. And God's been unfolding for a while um, his act of redemption. He's been setting the stage for this moment. If we think back to this, the time that Hebrews was written, it's he's setting the stage for his son. He's built up to this uh, ever since Genesis 3, when, when man's sin was thus separated from God. Um, God has been working to restore his people, and um, he's t done that in different ways throughout history. 
but man kept failing in those ways, and finally it's, it's culminating in the, the sending of the Son. A permanent fix for, for man's sin is now offered um, long ago at many times and in many ways. God has spoken to his people. He's revealed himself to his people in lots of different ways. Uh, through creation, we've talked about that. Um, Romans, uh, Paul writes that, that if you just look around you, it's screaming that there's a creator, that, that the created points to the creator. Um, God talked in a burning bush. He talked in visions. He used prophets, these writers of the Bible, different men and women he spoke through to his people. Uh, he even used a, a donkey at one point. <laughs> Look at the book of Numbers. God has used lots of different things to reveal himself to us. We know his word now has revealed himself to us. Um, but now the, the main event's coming. God is revealing himself to us through his son, um, I think of, of boxing, you got all these undercards, these not so great, still decent fights come, um, but the main event comes at the end, We've built up to this. Uh, we see that in lots of different things in sports. There's often the JV game, that's usually when I played in high school, uh, and then you had the varsity game, the big time stuff. Uh, that's what's happening now. God is sending his son. He's revealed himself in lots of different ways, but now it's come through Jesus Um, God's personal. He wants us to know him. That's why we have this class, because we know that God is desired that we would would know him more than we already do. Um, Hopefully this class has been beneficial. Um, God is continuing to show, I want to have a relationship with you, and my son is the best way to do this. Um, He could be a God that's very private. He could um, not, not reveal himself to us, yet he has. And the writer of Hebrews is showing he's doing that through his son. God has been persistent in communicating with people. He's been creative. I mean, he's a donkey, pretty creative. And how he's trying to get the point across of himself. But now it's about to get really clear, really simple. This is, this is as clear as it's going to get until we're in the kingdom of God with him. Um, and no longer on this earth, that this is who God is, and it's his son. So we want to look at the first four verses of, of Hebrews. Um, it be very simple. Uh, these aren't as hard of things to, to kind of deal with as we have in the past couple weeks. Um, but even though hopefully they're pretty simple to understand, hopefully they, we recognize them as true, and we recognize things that we would hold on to and, and believe of God, and that will help us grow in our understanding of Jesus and who he is, uh, what he's done for us, but the point of Jesus is is God. Sometimes we, the Trinity, we we have these different hierarchies. They're they're one. They're all significant. All three aspects of God are important. The Triune God is one, um, and, but all are important. And sometimes we we elevate different ones over the other. For all honest, the Holy Spirit, we're all kind of confused by anyway. So we kind of put it it's over here. Um, but sometimes we make Jesus the end goal uh, in a good, from a good motive of we, we know what Christ has done for us, and he, he gave his life to us. But Jesus is not the end of the Christian faith. We're following Christ as a way to get back to God. Um, that's not to diminish the work of Jesus. That's just to recognize that all three aspects of God, there's one God, and all three aspects of, of how he's revealed himself is, are important. Um, So Jesus should push us to realize that Jesus came to reconcile us back to God. Uh, We end with, like, Jesus forgave our sins. Yes, but the point of forgiving our sins was so we could have a relationship, so we too could could walk again with God in an intimate relationship, just like Adam and Eve once did. Um, He sent his son. So I'm just going to walk through some these first four verses together. He's spoken to us through his son, who's he's appointed the heir of all things. So inheritance, he's, he inherits all things from the Father. Inheritance is a word that we're pretty familiar with. Uh, we understand uh, usually what that means. You pass on what you have. Normally that is passed on from, uh, from parent to, to child. Especially, again, in, in this context, it was passed on to the, to the son. Um, obviously, sons were elevated. The firstborn son was elevated over all um, of their siblings. Um, during this time, they got everything that the dad had. Uh, we saw all about the fighting over the birthrights in the Old Testament. Um, the Bible talks a lot about inheritance. And 
And the writer knew that this language would resonate. Again, we want to we hear this the way that it was presented originally. And inheritance means something to us. It means even more than um, this language would, would really resonate with that audience. And he's the, he receives the, uh, as the creator, he's passed on everything to the Son. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Uh, he is the image of the invisible God. This is Christ, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and un- invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So God's creator of, of all of the created, uh, but even more so as our redeemer, Jesus, the son, has, has earned a vast inheritance of souls uh, through his work on the cross. So it's not just that he got the world and um, whatever else is out there, uh, our galaxies, everything. Uh, he's, cre- he's inherited us because of his work. We are Christ now. Um, and hopefully that you find comfort in that, uh, that you are not your own, you are his. Um, he's inherited you. He, he died for you is how he, how he earned that inheritance. Um, so he's, he's got the earth, these planets, the galaxies, if you're a science guy, like, I don't know, there's lots of stuff out there. We minimize, like, God's world to what our world is, is earth. But it, from, from God's perspective, there's who knows how much out there. We don't know. Um, it's all God's. He's given that all to his son as the creator as, and as the inheritance. Yet the real treasure of what Christ has and ultimately what God has is us. It's his people. It's his sons and daughters. We're the, the ultimate piece of creation. Um, he didn't stop with, with land and water and night and day, uh, animals Like, man, mankind is God's creation. It's who glorifies him. Um, But what's great is because of Christ, you see this in Romans 8, 17, we too are heirs. So we, whatever Christ has, we inherit from him. Um, So we are are kings and and, and queens. We are... Uh, we are inheriting everything that Christ has. That doesn't mean we just get to lay claim to, to things outside of our earthly expense, because that's not what God's talking about. He's talking about something so much bigger than right now. We have our little piece of property, if you own a house or land or something. But that's not what God's messing with here. He's thinking of an eternal perspective, when we too will inherit all things through the work of Christ. So Christ inherits. He also creates. We've kind of already hit on this, but uh, again, you see... Um, through whom he also created. Um, God, Jesus was there with God. Jesus is not just coming, even though it wasn't in December when Jesus was born probably, but he, he didn't just come to existence when he came to earth. He always existed eternally with the Father, so did the Holy Spirit. Um, the, this creation as we know it, it's still expanding. The galaxies are still going. Um, it's all created by God. He was creative in his creation it's not just simple earth was just people and people looking at some stars. Um, there's so much more to that. But Jesus was a part of that creation. He was there. You can see it. If you look back in Genesis, you can, you can see Christ is there. There's a, uh, he's created something so vast it's incomprehensible. And Christ was a part of that. So, so Jesus inherits. He creates. Um, he's the, subs- the substantial and ups- unsubstantial were created by Christ. What can you actually create? Nothing. We use the word create. We use the word develop or engineer. But we're just working with things that we already have, with a mind that was not our own but given to us, with products that already have existed. We cannot actually create something out of nothing. We're creating using what's already been created. Yet Jesus, God, creates out of nothing. It's one of those incomprehensible things. It's simple to say, Jesus created something out of nothing yet to, and that's where a lot of people get hung up. But like, how could this happen? How our minds are so simple that we, we can't even understand because we can't do it. Um, usually our, our experience drives what our understanding is. But that's why faith is such an important piece of the Christian life. That's what separates us from those that don't have faith. Um, we, science, I do believe, explains a lot about Christianity. Um, but the uh, different systems that we have in place, the different studies that we have are ultimately going to fall short because they're just, they can only go past what our minds and the brain is incredible, but it's still limited and it's not what God's mind is. Um, Christ creates out of nothing, um, including turning dead people into new creations, which is this beautiful part. 
um, our salvation, a new believer, um, is a new creation. We think limit creation a lot of times so just the dirt and water and skies. That's, that's not the only creating work that God is doing. Uh, God is creating a new creation, and that's through people, through what he did on the cross. The old is gone, the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5.17. You might have that one memorized. He creates out of nothing, creates a meaningful, eternal person out of nothing. He's taken our, our sin, we're dead in our sin, uh, and yet he creates life out of that. So even you, even your unbelieving family members you may be around, your coworkers, um, those that hopefully will, Lord willing, benefit from the money we're going to give to missions today that, that we may never even know, um, they are not beyond the creative power of God, that he can take their, their dead life, the, the lack of life that they have, and make something out of it, make it a vessel, an honorable vessel. You are not an exception to that. Your family members, the worst people in the world, are not an exception to, to God's power to create new things out of nothing. Because that's what we are apart from Christ. We are nothing. Um, we value ourselves more than that. But it's not true. Uh, we, we are nothing, and yet God sees something in us. And ultimately, he sees our, his son. The writer goes on to say that, that Jesus radiates. He's, um, he's the radiance of the glory of God. Um, this is a reference to the Shekinah glory of the Old Testament where God shows the Israelites he was with them through this. Um, he's, he's radiating God to us. He's, Jesus is a reminder that God is with us. It's Emmanuel. God is with us. He came, he sent his son to remind his people, to show his people, I've not forgotten you, I am with you. Again, he's done that in different ways and now, and he still is doing that through his son. So when you see Jesus, that obviously should say and mean a lot of things to us, but one of those is that God has not forgotten us, that God is um, with us. So Christ living in our hearts, we've invited Jesus into our heart. That, that's God with us. With us personally, that's not just a, um, in the Old Testament, it was with, I am with my people, I am with Israel. It's much more personal. God is with you if you are in Christ. Um, that also should be a reminder of us to, to be watching how we live, to live a life worthy that we're taking uh, Jesus with us everywhere. I remember in high school, um, some evangelist guy came in and was just railing on every bad, sinful place you could go. And it's true. It was kind of funny how he said it, but it was like, you're going to go to a bar or a club or whatever, and you're taking Jesus in there. Uh, is that, and there's truth in that. The reality is, like, we, Christ is everywhere anyway. He's already in those terrible places. But are you living a life that's, um, that's worthy of the God who is indwelled in you? Um, you uh, it should bring conviction to us. It should bring Guilt in some sense, yet we, our guilt should be then given to Christ and repentance um, and be freed from that. Um, but God is radiating himself to us through his son. He's, he's reminding us that, that we're there uh, with him at all times. Um, verse 3 goes on to say he's the ex exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is the exact imprint of God. Um, in that day, there was uh, seals from, from their rulers or, or coins from their rulers. These are all replicas. They're exactly um, like the original. That's what a copy is. Um, so when Jesus is representing us to God, when we look to Jesus, we know he's representing God. He is who God is. Um, an exact imprint refers to the image on a coin. Uh, that's the, the Greek language there. That perfectly corresponds to the image on a die that it was made from. Um, it's separate. It's not the same. Physically, it's a separate thing, but it is the same thing. Um, Jesus is representing God to us. I said this last week, but when you want to know something about God, look to Christ. So when you read the New Testament, you see how Jesus handles situations. That's how we know how God would handle that situation because he is God. He's representing God. Um, this, that's the complexity of the Trinity. Um, but, to, but simply, 
when you see Jesus, you're seeing God. What, what Jesus does is how God does it, does how we should do it. As Christians, as, as little Christ, as followers of Christ, we should respond in the same way. Um, so when you have Jesus as radiator and representer, you see Jesus' relationship with God in the Trinity. Jesus is part of the source. God is the original light. He's the original source here. He's a, and Jesus is a part of that. Yet he's this distinct person. He's the son. Um, through Jesus, we know how God speaks, loves, relates to people. Um, we know these things. It's yet another reason why it's just important to be in his word. So we know what we know of Christ comes from the Bible. And we, uh, our two-year study in Luke on Sunday mornings is showing us not just who Jesus is, but through that, who God is. Again, we're, we're learning about our God. Um, so he's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the power of his word. God is sustaining. Jesus is sustaining. Um, Jesus did not create and leave, uh, nor is he, I think this is important, they didn't just, God didn't just put things into motion when he created the world and then stepped back. Things aren't just passively happening. He didn't just say, like, this water keeps flowing, this land keeps happening, like, plants keep filtering carbon dioxide into oxygen and then step back. Um, like, I, a lot of my roles uh, here at church, it's basically I'm a glorified project manager. So I, I get a team, I get them working on something, and then I'm out of there. Like, put great people in their roles, and things just happen. That's happening all over this building this morning. There's stuff happening. We're not, I'm not actively there. I'm right here with you. That's the only place I can be. Um, I may get a bunch of texts. My phone may buzz, but we'll figure it out later. Like, I have put some things into motion, and I've stepped out. That's not what Jesus does. He is actively in a, a part of everything. So he's sustaining everything, not just by saying, keep going, life, and all functions needed for life. He could do that, but he's actively a part of it. Um, he's, he's keeping things into existence, and it says he does it by his spoken word. Um, word here is not logos, like, f- remember that, it's not the Bible in that. Uh, that's the revelation of, of God. Uh, he's sustaining everything by talking. He's just saying that Jesus is speaking everything, not just into existence like he did in Genesis, He's speaking everything going. So he's saying, let the people in room 103 at Buck Run keep living. Like, he's actively a part of that. Um, Which, again, just should grow our expanse of of who God and who the Son is. Um, Like, how how things happen. It's an active action by God. This is not a passive thing. Um, If Jesus stopped talking right now, because it says he's created and sustains everything by the power of his word, if he stopped talking, everything would cease to exist. It's not that like in the movies when stuff like crumbles, like it would just not be there. Um, That is how active God is. He's holding everything together. Um, This universe would, would cease to exist without God. Jesus is sustaining his creation. That's the universe. That's the earth. And put most personally, that's you. That's me. Nothing is happening outside of God's will in our life. Nothing's happening around us. There's no freak coincidences. Uh, God is, it not just knows what's happening. Jesus doesn't just keep up with us like, oh, let me see what happened in Scott's life yesterday. He's, he's actively with us. and He's sustaining us through those moments. Um, and, and studying Hebrews 1, that's probably the biggest Maybe second biggest takeaway for me is how active God is in our life. And not just God the Father, but the triune God. Um, that, that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are actively doing things in my life every second um, of the day. He upholds the universe by the power of his word after making purifications for sins. It's almost like this, this is kind of the funny part for me in this passage, is that the writer, uh, after making purification for sins, he sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Like of everything that Jesus does, it's almost like he's just like, yeah, he purifies our sins. Which think of everything that goes into purifying our sins. It's just the side that he makes. Um, We highlight, obviously, appropriately, Jesus' ultimate aspect of who he is for us because this is what's most meaningful to us in a lot of ways, is his life and death, 
perfect life and then death and burial and resurrection. Because uh, that obviously changes the trajectory of mankind and our lives specifically. Um, but I, I think it's kind of brushed kind of quickly here to show, to help us see that Jesus is doing so much more than that. That's not to lessen his work on the cross, ultimately why God sent him to earth. But Jesus' role um, in, in mankind, in creation, was happening long before he came as a baby to earth. Because he, because he was creating, because he was sustaining, he was doing those things before he took on flesh. He had a, um, he had a, a fully functioning role as God the Son, before he came in the flesh as man. Um, we, we think of Christ's life just, because that's what we know most of, is obviously his 30 whatever years on earth. That's what we know most about him. So that's what we talk and think about most when we think of Christ. But I think the writer here is trying to show us that there is a much, we should have a much bigger view of of who Jesus is and what he's doing than just purifying our sins, than just providing a way back to God, which is enough right there. I think it's, it's appropriate that we highlight that. I think he's helping us understand that purifying our sins, reconciling us back to God is not the only thing God, the Son is doing. Um, but again, please don't walk out here lessening the work of Jesus. Just elevate, praise him more, realize that he's doing so much more. Um, and then he rules. He does, um, he does all these things. And then he sits down and he just keeps ruling. Um, and this is something that I don't think is impa- as impactful to us as it would be to, to a Hebrew reader. Because um, we, we sit down a lot. We rest a lot. Some of us at different aspects of that. But I have no problem sitting down. I enjoy it. I enjoy rest. I like working. But it's fun to like just rest and watch a game or something but we're we're kind of the first culture that's really done that um, at the rate that we do it um, think of just what we know of the Israelites and the Hebrews uh, they were always going and, and we're not we have lots of things to, to help us yeah yeah uh-huh Yep, that's where we're going. Right. Yep. So what, had, what they would do is, okay, this shows us that there are no more sacrifices. Right. That he is enough as for sin. Yep, that's right. Um, so they're, they're going, and as uh, you just pointed out here, so think back to the Levitical priests um, that were, their job, they're constantly having to provide sacrifice. Um, and when they were in the tabernacle, their garments even had bells on them. And if their bells went silent, everyone knew they had died, and no one else could go in there, so they, would, they had a rope tied to them, and they would just pull them out. So it's not that, like, they got to even go in there and, and sit down for a minute. The bells were always ringing, because they're always working, going, going, going. And that's how busy it was, as he's right over here, to, uh, to keep up with the sins that are being committed, that they're always having to sacrifice. So, so Jesus is doing all of these things, and he's showing, I'm different than you. You have to, to work and work and work to try to keep up, not just to provide for yourselves. That's what he's talking about. He's talking to work for, um, for them to, to atone for their sins. And yet Jesus is doing all of these things, and he's able to sit. And there's a, there's a difference. There's a distinction that's coming. Because um, ultimately, those priests weren't taking away any sins. They were, they were taking these actions that would honor God and God would forgive those sins. They weren't really taking them away. But Jesus is. The propitiation that we've talked about of our, of our wrath that's, that's coming for us and still is even if we're in Christ, yet that Jesus steps in and takes that on himself. They're, the priests were putting on makeup. They were, they were trying to, it was, a, it was a short-term fix. It was something they were constantly having to do. They were just trying to cover up what was happening at a very crazy rate. We know because Israelites are a mess, like we are. It will same be true. We would have a, we wouldn't be able to sit down either if we had to like work, provide for our family, and then figure out how to atone for our sins. We would all be very, very busy. 
Yet Jesus is doing all these things. And he sits. And it's, it's language that you can just read over. Um, but, but Christ has the, the power to do it very differently than we would. Tells them we wouldn't be able to, but God had provided a way through the old covenant. Jesus is different than us. He takes away the sins of his people. He washes them white as snow. And he sits down because the work was completed. That aspect of his work. Obviously, he's still creating, sustaining, creating new life in us. He's, he's sustaining what he's created. But his main aspect... His task when he came to earth was to wipe away the sins of the world. And he's done his part through the cross. He lived that perfect life. He, he was tempted just like we were. Um, that's a whole other thing we could get into. Because uh, sometimes we like, well, he was Jesus. He was able to, like, no, he had the same temptations. Whatever temptations you're experiencing, Jesus was, too was tempted in the same ways. And yet he was obedient to the Father at all times. Thus he was able to to be obedient on the cross. If he had sinned, it didn't matter if he still would have gone to the cross. It would not have done what was planned. Because he didn't sin, he goes to the cross. He dies. Death, blood is what covers sin. It was perfect. Um, his, he shows us his power over death through his resurrection. He's provided that. He's, he's done the big thing. And then he sits down. That's the God that we believe in. It's not a God, again, that's sitting in a passive way. It's a God who's actually in control. He's not relying, though there are lots of things that need to be done. He's not relying on us. He's not, um, he's not needing. There are religions where we're constantly providing sacrifice so that uh, the God will be nourished and have the strength to do whatever that God's for. Like the God of healing, you need to, to give him food so he'll have enough energy to heal you. God doesn't need us. He doesn't, doesn't have to have you. He's sitting down right now at the right hand, a position of honor with the Father, having already... Again, we've talked about the already not yet tension. We talked about that last week. So in some sense, it's like, oh, everything's done. In our sense, it's like, we, Jesus is still saving people, and Jesus is still taking on our sin, and Jesus is still um, calling us to go and tell other people. So there is this like weird tension, and that's how the Bible is. All throughout the Bible, it's just already not yet. Already not yet. But one day it's going to be yet. It's time. Um, Right. I mean, how do you, I think you're in heaven. Right. It's just weird. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's a. Yeah. There's a real glorious mystery. I think it does appropriately fall into this category of what Jesus has all power and authority, and yet gave up a lot of that when he came to Earth. So he's not sitting there in the manger. He is fully God, but he has is, he is given up some of his attributes and abilities by choice. He's humbled himself in that way. And you can get like in all kinds of weird <laughs> spots there, but that, it, it, it is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's important to think, like, through some of your own work, could you, could you atone for your own sins? Could you make yourself right before God? The answer we all know is no, of course not. Yet, one, sometimes we act like we can, functionally. So we think that, like, if we, we just do this better, we'd be all right. Or we, we, oftentimes it's, it's not that we intentionally think that we could work a little harder and earn some salvation. It's that we diminish our sin and think that there's not much work to be done. So that we, we've whitewashed kind of our sins or taken for granted that just because we're in Christ, it doesn't mean that our actions are as bad or as negative. Um, 
I would argue that becoming a Christian opens you up to, to more sin in your life because you still have all the same earthly temptations and yet now you have more responsibility. So we could sin, an unbeliever is not sinning by not telling other people about Jesus. In a sense they are because they're separated from Christ so everything they do is a sin. But we now have a specific responsibility of as Christians, we have, we have different, an unbeliever still has those responsibilities but they don't even realize it. We should be spending time with God. We should be telling other people about Jesus. We should, all people are designed to bring God glory, but we now know better. And we have the Spirit to help us do that, and yet how often we, we don't do those things. Um, very simple things that, that we should do. Um, and we, we take that for granted. That at, It's not that we're like not telling, these are called sins of omission, things that we should be doing. We a lot of times think that's what I think we take for granted a lot of times and, and realize that, that, but thankfully, Christ still died and still atones for those. So can you work and can you do all these things to, for yourself? No, you'd be a very busy guy, just as busy as the priests were. Yet in Jesus, we can find rest. And rest is a really loaded word in the Bible. But ultimately, we should, we should take a seat and trust in Christ. It doesn't mean we sit back and be passive on whatever happens. I think rest in Christ would lead us to being more active in the faith. We need to, but rest, I think, will give us perspective. We need physical rest. Um, I don't hold to a literal Sabbath, but I think it's a great principle. I think it's a principle that God has, has given us to, to have time and, and rest. Um, that may not be... Because I, d- I don't see that move carried over from the Old Testament to the New Testament, so I don't think it's still a, a mandate. Um, but rest, as far as uh, on the seventh day, you do absolutely nothing. Jesus was pretty clear. There's some things you should be doing on that seventh day, um, especially for the good and glory of God. But we should be physical rest. Uh, you don't need to be a workaholic. You don't need to be a busybody all the time. And we need to have a good pattern of rest that looks different in different people's lives, and I think that's okay. But there's a, a spiritual rest that I think the Bible is more talking about than simply give your, get some sleep or give your feet a break. There's a, a spiritual rest, and that comes through actively pursuing Christ, which we hope this class helps you do. We hope that Buck Ron is helping you as a church in different aspects, through community groups, through worship, through fellowship with one another, is, is helping you um, find rest in Christ through a a spiritual growth, rejuvenation, um, pulling away from all the stuff around us, sometimes even people, uh, people close to us, to to go and spend time. Uh, I know people that that a couple days a year just go to a cabin or go into the woods and just read their Bible and pray and spend time in the creation. And and as that gives rest, that may not be your thing, that may not be something you're able to do. Uh, we all have different seasons of life, different demands of life. Um, but there should be a daily rest with the Lord. We call that Bible study. <laughs> Quiet time. That's spiritual rest. Yeah. Um, saying that makes me think like sometimes we've, we read the Bible and we just read it. We're not pondering it, not slowing down. We're not seeking, like, what does this teach us about God? What does this teach us about man? Is there something I need to do? Like, these, whatever your rubric of questions are in your, in your Bible study. The Christian life can, can make you busy. Church can make you busy. <laughs> I know that's something we wrestle with. We don't want to call our folks here to, to be busier than we should be so that we're distracted from other things that we should be doing. Active life in the church is important. Um, but it too can make you too busy to to find rest, to to really focus on this Jesus, uh, God's Son. And the more time that we focus on Christ, the more time that we spend in in God's Word, the more we will ultimately know about God, which all things are ultimately created to point us to God and to bring Him glory. And that includes His Son, Again, we, we look to the Son so that we have so that we can see God and have a way back to Him. 
Um, we are indwelled by the Spirit so that we can carry out uh, through the Spirit's power what even Jesus wasn't uh, called something greater than him. He's like, the Spirit's coming. This is going to get easier for you, disciples. You're going to now be indwelled with God and have the ability to do what I've called you to do. Which again just shows the overarching love, care, and thoughtfulness of God. He doesn't just have, you might have a boss that has like crazy high demands for you and then doesn't really give you a way to to meet those demands. Like that's the workplace. <laughs> um, that's not God. God does have high standards. When you mess up, he's provided a way back. And he's given you this being, this part of himself, the spirit, to help you do, to help you have the power to do all these things he's called you to. He's the ultimate um, authority, not just in because he has ultimate power, but in how he helps us along in, in doing what we need to do, which uh, I know we've had a Christians in the Workplace class that talked about when you're leading others to, to model after God, to not just set, hey, go do this, like help people along, which is an important aspect of life, of parenting, right? We don't just say, I'm just telling my kids, like, you need to have a better attitude or a lot of times this is all I say, but shouldn't be. Like, help them. What does that look like? Explain these things. This is what God's doing to us. So, any questions over these six weeks that we've been together? Any, any thoughts? Um, anything? This class could go forever, and it will in your life, in your pursuit of Christ. So, there are some things in this world you could grasp the bulk of everything you need to know about it. And that's not true of God, yet we can. I'm trying to think of what my big takeaway would be for this class. Like what's our, if we walk away with one thing, and it's hard to narrow that down, but one is to realize that we, we need to, we will never know everything we need to know about God until we're with him. Yet we should pursue to know everything about God and that's possible. So, Again, in week four, I talked about like one of the, the main reasons we want to offer this class is to, to equip us to, yes, know more about God, but to be able to talk about it with others. We don't talk about, or we shouldn't, talk about more than what we understand, right? That's how you get some crazy people. They just speak for them. They don't know. They just start talking. We want, you're not going to step into a conversation with an unbeliever that maybe you know is going to fight back on some things if you don't have a good understanding. In reality, we need to do it anyway. You're not going to have all the answers, and that's okay. We don't have all the answers. <laughs> um, as your pastors, and we've gone to school a lot and read a lot of stuff, and yet we still don't know. But we can know more, and the more we know, the more encouraged we will be to go and tell others. And that's what we want it to have, as, for all of us to have, is a real heart for other people. Uh, and that comes from the overflow of what our heart really is about God. So where we stand before God, not just in the justification sense, but how we, how we handle God's word, how we really view God. So when we understand that God is actively in our life sustaining it, that's going to change our moments. It's going to change what we're doing. Um, it's all intermingled together. Yet the more we know about God, the more we desire to, to, to seek him, the more we're going to want to seek him more. Um, and the more we're going to want to tell other people about him. I have a great example of this practically in my life is Dr. York. The more time I get with Dr. York, the more I want to be around him because he's funny, he's really knowledgeable, he's a great guy to be around. But then the more I get to know him, the more I like to talk about him to other people. Um, that's true in so many things. That's true in things that aren't important either. The more I like my sports teams, and enjoy them, the more I want to tell other people about them. We talk about what we care about. This is also what we should be talking about. And yet, it always is, not always, that's a churchy thing, or like, oh, come and talk about Jesus again. Like, it's okay. Let's do it. Especially going to these holidays. Christmas. We're through Thanksgiving now. Christmas. Be specific. We're stepping in in a few days. We're going to be all around family, workplace, in and out of the office. Um... I hope that, that studying God is a, now, a new, if not already, but a lifelong pursuit now for each of us and that it motivates us to talk with others about him. If you truly know God, you talk about him. That's why like, I firmly disagree with churches that hold back new believers 
There are people like, well, you need to be in the, and there's some roles, like you're not like, oh, came to Christ, the next day you're getting ordained as a pastor, or we're going to put you, uh, you know, teaching our students tomorrow or something. There's certain roles, but we love, when folks come to Christ, we love to put them on the welcome team, because they're the happiest people. They're not as like, some of us have just kind of lost our enthusiasm times, it feels like, for the Lord. We, we should have that desire all the time, yet our, our, our fire kind of dwindles a little bit. That's a, I, we love hearing testimonies. It's why we talk a little bit about testimonies when we baptize someone, to, to share a little bit of that story, to hope that, that that encourages us to have that zeal, to be zealous for our, our God. So I just... I just encourage you to, to realize that there are real depths to who God is, and it's understandable. There are big words, there are scary words, there are things we have to wrestle with, there are some hard things to know about God, yet we should, shouldn't shy away from it. So I want to pray for us to, to that end, and if I'd be happy to continue that conversation now or in the future, and um, if there's ever questions, would love to... Um, help you get those answers as we all seek to to pursue our Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for um, your son and the chance to to spend time talking about him. God, thank you that as we look to Christ, we find you. Um, God, as we pursue Christ, that is a noble task. And ultimately, it is the right pursuit because to pursue Christ is to pursue you. Uh, God, thank you for your active involvement in our life. God, thank you that you are a God, the true God, but also a God that, uh, that loves his people, that provides a way for his people through salvation, a way back to you, but a way to, to honor and to live um, life in our, our day-to-day happenings. God, I pray that we would continue to God, seek you, seek your son, live out all the many things that you've called us to do. But God, that we would just find rest in you. And that we would just seek to, to, to know you, not just know more about you for the sake of um, trivial knowledge, but that knowledge of you would lead to radical change in our life and thus in the lives of everyone around us. God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.